Hello, everyone. My name is Luigi Galimberti. I'm a board member of Resartis. Resartis is a worldwide network of art residencies, and we, we have more than 500 members in 75 countries. Uh, and we have um, co-organized uh, this series called Residences in Challenging Time with YASPIS, which is the international exchange program of the Swedish Arts Grants Committee, and also with the support of Creative Victoria. As, a, as an introduction to today's webinar, uh, I will quickly tell you why we decided to, to organize this series. Of course, the, the drive behind this is, is COVID-19, is the, the impact that COVID-19 and the pandemic has brought on artists, uh, on art professionals, and the wi wider um, cultural and creative sector. COVID has brought uh, substantial disruption to, um, to our lives. Uh, first of all, when we talk about COVID, we, we shouldn't forget that this is about people. Uh, unfortunately, the death toll uh, passed uh, 1 million people all over the world, recorded deaths because of COVID, and this is something that we cannot forget, even when we talk uh, about COVID in, 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 in the cultural sector, artistic sector. First of all, this is something that affected uh, our communities. Uh, and it's having a significant impact, and unfortunately, it looks like this is not something that is not going away. But the impact, of course, has been on the economy. And the impact has been and will be on an already fragile cultural um, sector. But uh, at the same time, uh, we thought that talking about COVID would not be enough. Uh, we thought that uh, we had to broaden the, the discussion and include uh, what uh, we believe are two strategic topics that needs to be at the top of the agenda of every cultural organization. Uh, one topic which we will address um, during the next webinar is, of course, the uh, environmental, uh, environmental challenge. So the, the, the issues with climate change and, and how we are not responding to this change or we are aggravating this change. But during this webinar, uh, we will be discussing uh, what is another key issue that is uh, essential to the sustainability uh, and future of, of, of humanity. And it's a, it's a, it's a question of, of social justice, the question of racial justice, uh, particularly on the background of the Black Lives Matter movement. And with us today to discuss uh, this topic, uh, we have uh, Yinka Sanibare. Yinka uh, is a London-based um, uh, artist. Uh, his practice uh, explores colonialism, post-colonialism within the context of globalization. Uh, Yinka's work has been exhibited widely. Uh, he has been on the fourth plane of Trafalgar Square, uh, uh, but uh, his works uh, are shown in collection at Tate, MoMA, and all over the world. But particularly uh, in, uh, in, in during the last last years or many years, uh, Yinka has been running a project called Well Guest Projects in his London studio, and he offered um, he has been offering a space for artists to be to be creative, a space for creative failure. And from that experience, in 2019, he established the Yinka Shanibare Foundation. Uh, and from then, the guest artist gas project in, in Nigeria, uh, which he, he, will, um, he will tell us about. Uh, the second speaker with us today is Lisa von der Brunke Hoffman. She's the executive director of the Alliance of Artistic Communities. Alliance for Artistic Communities is an international artist residency network board in the 1990s with the aim of recognizing creative process and exploration of new ideas as something essential to, to human progress. Lisa is a scientist by training, um, and she, she sits in, in, in various boards, uh, such as the Institute Museum and Library Services and the Performing Arts Alliance. I am very grateful uh, to Yinka Lisa for having accepted our invitation, and I look forward to, to the conversation with them. Uh, but 
before uh, before giving the floor to 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 Yinka, uh, I would like to briefly present you some questions that we are going to to address today, um, and and you can see them on the screen. Uh, we are talking about a uh, gaps in representation in residencies. Uh, but of course, it's not just a matter of uh, residences; it's the, the, wide, the wider, the wider sector, and also how residences can fill the gap, not just with with words, uh, but with with facts and with, with action. And how how can we make this change all together? Um, and and this is, uh, I think, one something that is something that is is key to. To keep in mind when we discuss again about about COVID and about about society more in general, uh, there is a now the discourse is about when are we going finally be able to be when are we finally able to go back to normality? Uh, but but that's a very dangerous question. Uh, do we really want to go back to normality? Uh, what 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 is what what was the normality before COVID? Uh, uh, I, it might be argued that it was a, a normality made of widening inequalities, a normality made of a weakening of cultural and social fabrics, a normality of increased mass surveillance, and a normality of institutional racism. So do we really want to go back to normal? Maybe not. And maybe we, we cannot afford to go back to normal because the, the, the society we live in is, is a society uh, which which is uh, characterized by waste. It's a waste of natural resources as much as a waste of human capital. Uh, and, and, and I think that the importance of, of this topic during the COVID context is really crucial because this is for, for us, for everyone, an opportunity to make a difference uh, in society. And, and with this, I'm really happy to, to leave the floor to Yinka. Well, thank you for, uh, for having me. And um, I want to start by the reason I created a platform for artists. Um, you know, I ran a project in my studio in London uh, called uh, Guest Projects. I gave space to artists uh, of all kinds, all different art forms, to um, have space to experiment uh, a space I described as a space where artists can fail. Um, I did this in the context of the commercialization of the art world and the elitism of the art world, which actually meant that if you didn't know someone, um, if you didn't work with a gallery, it was very difficult for you to have a space to show your work, especially in a city like London where space is extremely expensive. And, uh, you know, I wanted to give artists that opportunity. But then, you know, there are a number of social issues that actually emerged out of that. Uh, the lack of equality, the, uh, the number of black artists who don't have spaces to show. Um, I had a resident, um, you know, a black theater company. Uh, and they used my space to do their rehearsals and they were able to actually tour their performances as well. So this is also about engaging people through their art in their profession so that through that they can, they can have space to develop. But then I did that residency for 11 years. And then after 11 years, I mean, of course I, you know, I'm, I grew up in Nigeria and um, you know, I, li I live in London, even though I was born in London, I grew up in Nigeria. So I'm very aware of um, the relationship that the West has to Africa. And the traffic is always you know, in one direction uh, for proper cultural exchange and engagement. I felt it was necessary to actually do something on the continent of Africa. So I embarked on the process of uh, research and then uh, eventually I registered at the Yinka Shonibari Foundation. So we, um, you know, I started this process about eight years ago. 
we we are now building the building in Lagos, uh, Nigeria. Um, can you bring up the first uh, slide? And so we're we're sort of um, I would say possibly three quarters of the way there. And um, yeah, so that is uh, the building that. Uh, it's in Lagos. Uh, Lagos is a culturally exciting city. Um, I'm sure those of you who know about Nigeria, you, you know about the Afrobeat that's coming out of Nigeria. Um, you know, people like Burner Boy, Wizkid, all this kind of, you know, the musical scene. And then, of course, there's Nollywood. Um, and this is by the Atlantic Ocean. So it's, it's by the ocean. And the... Um, so it's a, it's a kind of dynamic um, environment. And so what we have here, we're going to provide artists with uh, three uh, bedrooms. Um, and so we can have, in this house, we can have three artists and there is a gallery uh, that also doubles as a work uh, space. But the important thing about this is that I wanted to engage with the local artists. So can we go to the next image? Okay, so I visited Lagos and I met with the local artists. Um, they made presentations of their work. I wanted to introduce them to the idea. And also most importantly, when we actually launch, I want to display the works of the local artists in the building. But so I actually want the artists to feel ownership of the, of the project at the outset. But, and I didn't want to, the other important part of this project is that it's important that we address some of the uh, very difficult um, issues around social justice, around uh, the environment, environmental sustainability. And, you know, and also we all know, I mean, we've all seen, unfortunately, we've seen people trying to emigrate and people are unfortunately drowning at sea. And of course, you know, people really prefer, they would rather stay in their own homes. And I felt that as a residency program, we had to engage with some of the social issues on the ground. And we have to be giving something back to the community that we're, that's going to host us. So I, I then acquired a 54-acre uh, farm. Um, so if we go to the next one. So this is um, a launch. Um, we have, we've actually started agriculture um, in the farm and we have, um, you know, we've planted maize, uh, plantain, uh, cashew, you know, we have a number of crops. We've got five greenhouses doing tomatoes, peppers, and vegetables. But the point of that is to, well, first of all, the artists can also go into a rural area, which is two hours away from Lagos. And we want to uh, practice, do some conservation there as well. We're going to plant trees, and artists will be able to actually go, you know, on the farm and also we are going to start a small craft enterprise uh, on the farm and there's a village near the farm. And, but this is social enterprise that's in parallel with the residency because it's important that we create sustainable residencies. And so um, we, the social enterprise we're creating is called SGI Projects and that stands for Studio and Guests Indigenous, indigenous Projects. Uh, so SGI Projects. And we, we are going to go through a year of uh, training people in um, you know, creating some of the local crafts from weaving to uh, accessories, uh, which we then hope to sell um, online as a parallel social enterprise to the residency. And, um, and if you go to the, the next one, and that's the inside of the greenhouses. And we, um, 
I, I guess at the moment we've got up to about five farm workers and we've, we've been doing this for about a year and we're already paying all of their wages uh, from, the, uh, from the crops that we produce. And the farm is, uh, so over a period of the next um, year or so, uh, the farm will be even more mature. We are in the process of building a barn house uh, where the artists can stay, and we're building uh, workshops as well uh, for, the, um, for the workers who are going to be working on the crafts. And so this is, uh, the next image is the barn house that uh, we're working on. We're going to be, it's a sustainable building, and we're going to be making our own bricks. And, um, you know, it should have the solar panels and so on. Um, so, you know, artists should be able to then consume what we grow on the farm. So that's uh, the idea, at least some of, some of um, what, what they eat will be from the farm. Um, because it's very important for me that um, there is a social dimension to the residency. So it's not about artists just going on holidays. You know, it's about being, you know, supporting food sustainability, exchanging ideas, and we are working on organic farming methods as well. But the residency is, is, is not simply a visual arts residency. So I would love for, you know, um, agriculture scientists to come and also uh, support uh, the sustainability of food production there. Um, I'd love people, you know, studying agriculture to come, uh, writers, uh, musicians. Uh, so, you know, it's, uh, we're looking at the, we're looking at culture as a whole. Um, we're going to do some conservation on, their, on the farm as well. So this is um, culture and horticulture uh, that we're, we're, we're looking at. So, um, yeah, so I guess that's uh, what I have to say for now about our plans. Um, I'm going to hop in here. Thank you, Inka. Um, firstly, I have to say it's an honor and privilege to be in this space with you. Um, I always uh, had last week and in this week working on my fangirl and just holding um, my presence. But I, I really want to say thank you. Um, I think what, you, what you're demonstrating is, is the possibility of residencies to do what um, I've been kind of really thinking deeply about in the past six months is world building activities. We, we've, we spend so much time talking about systemic change, right? We, we talk about remediating the system, but what does it mean to really get into rebuilding and reimagining and envisioning what it could be? And, and I think it's really just quite beautiful. So I want to say thank you for that, that, that work and, and for your vision and leadership. Um, I'm Lisa Funderberg Hoffman. I'm the executive director of the Alliance of Artists Communities. Um, as Luigi said, we're the global service organization for artist residencies. We, many of you may know this, we have 400 members uh, that span the US and 23 countries and we're the complementary organization to Res Artists. I think our numbers actually flip the other way. Um, and central to the work that we do and, and something that I've been really thinking about uh, is working to advance um, an equitable and sustainable field. So looking at those two things not being separate to each other, that you can have equity, we, we can really address um, these systems that seem to have really benefited some uh, and, and been at the expense of the others, and at the same time ensure the sustainability of our field. And, and thinking more importantly about how to deeply support staff, artists, and communities that are, that are impacting and advancing the residency field. So Yinka, when you talk about uh, the work in the community and the social enterprise and the way to support artists and uh, scholars in that, in that pursuit, it, it really feels whole. And I think um, it has been my experience, and, and this has been both a personally lived experience as well as what I have seen uh, in the field scans I've done and some of the site visits that we tend to think of these things as separate entities. You know, you have the artist residency campus, you have the artists that you invite, and then you have the staff that actually runs the residency as if each one of those populations are not central to the powering of the mission of that, that program and are not central to the, to the sustainability of that program. Um, also, 
we have started really thinking about the Alliance's position about embracing and, and our role as a knowledge sharing organization where uh, the Alliance is the conduit for moving knowledge um, and learning through the field. Um, you know, these conversations are so important because this is not me telling the story uh, of what you're doing, Nika. It, it's us in conversation about what the possibility, not only for our immediate work and what we're each doing, but to even take a more expanded view. Um, and and we, we believe that it lies in the people, it, the artists, the staff, the communities that we serve. So it's an honor and privilege to be here. Um, Lu Luigi asked me to take some time to talk about what we've been doing very specifically and what we're seeing in the field. Um, particularly, I, I think on the US side in this moment of um, the global pandemic, uh, global civil unrest and environmental uh, degradation and disaster. And I think the one thing we can say is that we've been really keenly focused on the people, okay? The people, the artists, the staff and their well-being, uh, because we realize that there is not going to be an artist residency field or a way to have conversations about supporting artists through residency programs, which we all love and, and value so deeply if we don't really get back to focus on the people that power those programs. Um, and I, I think what follows after that, and 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 Nika, again, I, I just have to go back because your example is no need to really go beyond that right now, is that the program design follows that, right? The fund development fo follows that. The way that you operationalize the work and get from um, your the program that is in the urban center to the farm, you can figure out how to get the car from A to B once you realize the people that are powering that program and what the aims and the objective around supporting the well-being of those people. The rest of the work really, for me, seems to come really easily. And, and we have been really, really pushing that um, that thinking and that centering. Um, and, and so, so um, Nika, if, if you're ready to go with me, I, I enjoyed our prep conversation so much. We just gonna, I'm gonna talk, throw out some things and we'll just have this, this very transparent con conversation. And I, I was thinking um, that, you know, you, you alluded that you have started this really with the community at the at the center of the work um and I, I, on that prep call I, I think really when i hung when we hung up and got off the phone i was like wow that is, that was really such a beautiful sentiment of all the work that you have done up until this point and you haven't even hosted an artist or even extended the invitation to host an artist which sometimes becomes all about the process you know the selection process who's going to be here when they're going to get here what are they going to do once they get here what's the project going to be and i found myself really inspired um and and again going back to the people that power the community and what what are you thinking about this in terms of representation and, and most importantly um I, I think i said this on the last call when i was at the last res artiste meeting in kyoto um, it was a beautiful meeting, but the one thing that was was absent was black and and I, I think I was one of two people that represented um, the African diaspora in the space um, and and we had a wonderful turnout and we were hosted by a wonderful group but the one thing that continues to be absent uh, consistently throughout the field and around the world is the absence of black and I'm just curious about what your thoughts are on that and, and what are some of the remedies and, and some ways to think about that um, and, and what you've done to position that differently. Well, you know, the issue for me is mainly about empowerment. And, it, you know, it's very, we, we as Black people historically, uh, we've always been on the uh, receiving end of philanthropy uh, mm -hmm. on the uh, receiving end of uh, you know oppression generally historically, um, and I think that it's very important that we empower ourselves and we empower others. Um, it's you know I think that you also know that uh, a number of um, very successful black artists you know which we'll come to later 
have been mm -hmm. creating their own residencies and they can see um, they can see that younger artists do need that kind of support um, in a situation where you know they wouldn't have that support otherwise. But coming to my own plan and the way I was thinking about the residency, I wanted to actually engage people from the outset. I wanted to engage local people. I didn't want to um, build the residency and then uh, start telling people about it or, or then inviting people to join something I already built. You know, I wanted people to, um, you know, to be engaged. Now, I'll, I'll tell you the thinking. From the architect, uh, the architect is a black female architect um, who, who is originally from uh, Ghana. And I, I felt that ideologically, I mean, that, that was actually an important thing to do because I also recognized that the world of architecture is very white male dominated. Mm -hmm. So starting from the, from the procurement and the contract from the outset. So I knew it had to be a black female architect. And also um, I knew that I had to go to Nigeria and speak to various uh, people about the project from starting from the artists to the um you know to the patrons of the arts you know there are art, there are black art, black art collectors right. and high net worth individuals um in nigeria in africa and so it's very important that the uh the artists can see that their patrons uh, you know, there, there are black patrons who uh, actually will support what they're doing. If we would tell those patrons, if we would give those patrons the information about what we're trying to do, because, you know, that's, you know, it's a two way exchange. Right. And so, and I, I think that, so for me, it's been essential to to prepare to engage the community and also on the farm in the village, there's a village near the farm. We went to uh, the village, we spoke to the chief in the village mm. and, the, and we also spoke to the youth uh, group in the village and they gave us permission to, um, and you know, and the land belongs to the village. It's not our land. We have access to that land for a hundred years. It's a hundred year lease. And the, and the land will go back to the owners of the land. And so we did that, uh, we prepared that work. And then, you know, we embarked on the process of supporting local infrastructure. So there was no access or very bad access into the village. I then had to build infrastructure. So I built a three kilometer road um, from my own pocket to support that community. And, you know, consequently, the, the village um, named the road after me. I was actually very, uh, you know, I was very honored, I was very honored uh, that, uh, that they did that. And, now, and they also wrote to me thanking me about the access. And as a result, and there are buildings, some you know, buildings coming up along the road. So we're not only uh, creating uh, a farm, we're also um, supporting local you know, uh, infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think that is really just wonderful. I mean, I wrote this down, I was like, talk to me, Yanka, because I'm like really excited by this idea of, of going to, um, the community and seeking permission, right? Like this idea of, of this is unceded land, this was not given to you, it was not yours to, to populate. And as I was thinking about our talk today, I was like, let me go back to the colonizers playbook and we go right, right to like dismissing or distorting the past. The first thing is, oh, this is my land. This is what I have access to. This is what I can do on this space. If you just let me buy it or we have a contractual agreement, 
but this idea of the first step of engagement is 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 seeking permission and 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 really thinking about what does that look like um, and then what is the reciprocity of that relationship i have been you know i've been on these calls and, and i talked to so many people and they say you know i, I got into a really heavy conversation be, um, a couple of months ago, because I put out in one of the newsletters that the artist residency field has its monuments too. And so much of the artist residency field uses the word artist colonies in their description uh, and descriptor of how we talk about our collective practice in our field. And I was like, you know, we could stop using that word colony. We actually are able to dismiss that because it's tied to such a, um, uh, it demarks a, a time of violence and, and, and a historical just um, subjugation of people in place, it's time to let it go. But you wouldn't believe some of the responses that I got back. And, you know, I'm always happy to have these conversations because I tell everybody, I'm a scientist. So, you know, if you're going to come talking to me about beehives and ant colonies, I'm here for it, right? Like it's a, it's an easy, easy conversation to start with. But I, I went back and it's like, you know, when we think about when artist residencies, they were born out of artist colonies, started in Europe around 18, the early 1800s. But they were never, never designed with Black and Black people in mind, right? So that revisionist history that the world, the word all artists can participate, that revisionist history that this is for any artist, or that revisionist history that many of these programs are sitting on unceded land <laughs> that were acquired by nefarious acts, as if that was an invitation for any artist to participate. And, and we had a call with some leaders from the field and they said, residencies, this is not, this is not new news. This is, it is what it is, but this is how this program was designed since its inception. And here you're giving us a way to think about what does it look like to build something new? What does it mean to build something in a new way to develop a higher standard for engagement and start to disrupt those patterns and trends of colonization that have held so many people back and that have hurt so many people over all of these years. Um, it is really quite beautiful. Um, and and I've, 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 been, I've been thinking about that, um, you know, that, you know, we use science, uh, we justify our, our, um, our, our histories and, and, and what we did and why. Um, and, and it is really super important to, I think for the residency field and artist residencies in particular, just to say, you know, it is what it is. This is what is the truth, but this, here's the opportunity for us to start thinking about that. What does a redistribution of power, redistribution of wealth, a reway of thinking about how we engage artists and community in our collective work, because this is something that we think is, um, really, really quite lovely. And that truth and transparency is really super important to move forward. I, I have a question for you, Yinka, because, you know, when Luigi contacted us, I, we were talking about this time of Black Lives Matter, right? And it, it, we call it a time, but this is, this is the largest civil rights movement in, in our history, right? Like this is, this is, it has touched every facet of the earth. And, 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 and it is changing lives, behaviors, and attitudes, and it is important. And um, it is my wish and it's my hope that it, it, it's just durational in nature, that this is what will be in this for a, a long and extended period, but what a beautiful moment of hope. Um, but on the other side of that is that we've seen this performance of letters, platitudes, statements of solidarity, um, and the time where, programs are reckoning and they're saying, oh, you know, we, we have to do something. We have to do something. But at the same time, a little bit fearful about, about making a change and, and how to support not only the artists that are practicing in this context, but their staffs, the staff that they don't have, their advisory boards and boards that are not representative or reflective of this time, but even down to their procurement practices. I think what you said about the architect is so important. Sometimes we think that hiring a black photographer is, is not important, but it is important. And, and I'm just curious what you think about um, the opportunity in this moment. I, I don't wanna talk about, I think we know the challenge, but what are the opportunities? Well, you know, the injustices have gone on for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, many organizations, they have uh, equal opportunities policies. 
um, you will find that the people who actually run and direct the organizations, they don't have, you know, black people directing the organizations, running the organizations. You know, I've been in the, in the art world now for quite a long time. I don't think I know of one black museum director. Mm. You know, one major, you know, major museum, I don't know of any. Mm. And I think, and I think that we have to start at, you know, who runs those organizations. And also, we should not really just talk about, you know, um, put out a statement about, you know, Black Lives Matter, what we're, you know, what, what are they actually doing? You know, what are they demonstrate, you know, they should demonstrate what they're actually doing. Right. And I think, you know, they, they have to start there. They have to start by actions, not statements. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I think that, you know, and, and I think that's, you know, that's absolutely essential. And also, you know, mentoring, mentoring is one thing that is, uh, you know, amazing. I mean, I, I, you know, I managed to, to get here doing what I'm doing because there were good people in the past who decided that they will give me a chance. They will give me an opportunity. And I think actually the whole idea of the residency, you know, came from me learning that lesson mm. that by mentoring, you can provide a stepladder for people, you know. Um, and I think also we as um, black people who are in positions of leadership, we have to show good examples. You know, we, we must not pull the ladder up behind us. Um, we, you know, so it is a huge responsibility, but there are black people who get to the position of power and they, they say, well, this is not my, my business. I can't change the world. Actually, you can change the world. You know, so if you find yourself in a position of power, you know, you have to do something about that. You have yeah. to ensure that you mentor, that you, you do have a responsibility. Otherwise, you know, the system will continue. Right. And so I think that this is not, and, and I also believe in collaboration. I believe that, you know, our white brothers and sisters must also join with us to actually, you know, whenever they, they see racism, they experience it, they must speak up and they must join with us. Because I don't think it's possible for us to do this alone. I, I really think that really good people, uh, regardless of their race or gender, you know, they have to intervene, but not just intervene by speech but intervene by action. You know, look at, your, look at your organization and the makeup of your own organization. Don't look at the next organization. You can do something within your organization. And, yeah. and I think, that, you know, that, that's where, where we have to go. So we're all responsible for this. I, I think you're right. And, and I agree with you. Uh, in one of my earlier writings, I wrote about unbreakable solidarity and this idea that you, it's not just enough to put the words out. It's not enough to just look ahead to the future. Um, and I was on a call earlier this week and, and talking about, you know, it's, it, this is not just about intellectualizing this and, and being in a space to think about and have ideas that it has to be tied to an action. It, it has to be tied to doing something and it needs to be a thoughtful action, right? You have to, you have to hold that action responsibly. And that, that requires that each person holds up a mirror to themselves and address those issues and biases, um, those assumptions and things that they've been holding um, and recognize that and say, you know, what am I gonna do differently? What are the patterns within me that are yes. preventing me from being able to do this work, to bridge these communities, to create a sense of belonging, to open up my heart in this way, to actually love, we, we say love in action, but like what is really, really holding us back because you may have the care to do it, but you could care about something. Bell Hooks says it all the time. You could care about something six days out of the week, but on the seventh day, you can care about that person, but you may be punching them in the gut and, and, and that would be deeply, deeply problematic. 
static. So what does it really look like to manifest love in action? Um, yes. and, it, and I think you've said that beautifully. And if you see prejudice, you have to call it out, you know, you gotta regardless call it out. of race. Right, right. We don't, we, don't, we don't get to walk away from it. <laughs> we we yeah. have to find compassion in our heart to love the other and to hold space. We have to find um, a certain amount of control and 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 distance and and to see a greater vision to to be able to do that. And what would it look like for everyone to embrace that? Um, what would that look like for that to be the norm? That being a normal no, that we exactly. carry. So well, and also the I wanted to ask you about the issue of black residency owners or, or the kind of you know black patrons of the arts and i wanted to because i you know we know that there are there are also a lot of high net worth black people out there and so how do you begin to actually get to those people yeah and to get them involved i i think i think yinka and I, and we touched on this the other day, and I think we both had that, that moment where we said, here's the opportunity. We have to leverage our collective networks to be able to bring and convene that group. And I put that as an immediate goal in my work for the next six months for the Alliance to start being a convener of the conversation, but not being the owner of the conversation, which is a, is a very, it's an invitation for Black indigenous and other people of color and their re residency operators to start thinking about what is our collective power? What is our collective worth? What is our collective opportunity? Because I think sometimes we have relied too heavily on the Alliance of Artists Communities, res artists to endorse us, to accredit us, to state our value. And we know that's out of the colonizers playbook too, because it's, it's saying, give us something that proves our worth, right? It's a very paternalistic POV. It, it, it is really rooted in um, this idea of um, that you have to prove yourself in order to be accepted. Whereas if we're talking about world building, if we're talking about building a new world and seeing the world that we, we envision, then we have to create our own. And, and I think that's the next work. And uh, I, I've, I've thought about ways to do this. And as, like a, as a black woman leading this organization at this, in this moment of time, it feels like some of the most important work to be uh, really um, dedicate that time, just like you said, you know, mentoring, um, really, really not pulling the ladder up to really increase the network to say, what can we do collectively? And then what does that look like support long term, not hinge, not hinge to these 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 communities these these networks that have been dominated by white supremacist culture by whiteness and that fall under what what we know you know you can't wait for something to end so that you can revert back to what the way things were which is you being in power with you running it or what does it look like for us to create our own because one thing i think we've waited for and the call for many years has been uh let's let people when so-and-so retires, I can take over that job, right? And we notice that so-and-so been in that job for 40 years. They're not going anywhere, right? And then when they do go, they hire the cousin or they bring up the next person that's coming in. And forget that, we're world building now. So I think that's our immediate next step and, and the work that, that you and I could really do something uh, really lovely on because it is there, it exists, um, and, it, and it can be a model for, for doing things uh, very different and really, residencies 5.0 like forget 1.0 2.0 5.0 um, yeah no, absolutely and the issue here is empowerment you know it's about empowerment mutual respect yes. and mutual engagement mutual respect and mm -hmm. i think even the whole issue of cultural exchange i deliberately wanted to locate the residency in africa because i feel that people actually need to open their eyes and they need to go and learn about other places. You know, I grew up with mythology about Africa. You know, um, I grew up with negative imagery about Africa on TV. I grew, you know, everywhere. And I think, you know, we need to change the script. Okay. You know, we just need to change it. And, you know, you, you get respect by actually, you know, people having to go to Africa. Right. And go, go and learn something, yes. you know, um, and I think that's actually very important. 
you know, it's, it's, very, it's very important that also, you know, we black people who also work and live in the West, you know, we want our cultures to be respected. Yes. And, you know, and so it should be a real uh, mutual exchange and, and learning. And that hasn't happened for centuries. No, no. It, it's, uh, I was uh, addressing a group of recent graduates last December and um, I am because you are is, is what I told them. And, and for some reason that, that doesn't go for black, right? We, we look around or outside of that and I think we need to get back in touch with really the seat of humanity and the opportunity, the beautiful, the gifts, the, the things that we have learned, that we have appropriated, that have been used, abused, erased. Here's a time to really celebrate what is, what is good and true. But by centering that, by centering that, we start to open up a door in a way that engages humanity in a different breadth and scope that, that is rooted in, in what we say, mutual respect, love, trust, commitment, it's all the things that we know, all the ingredients to, to build a loving and, and whole community. So I, I certainly would agree with you on that. Yeah. And what percentage would you say of the residencies that you run are kind of black run? You can't give a percentage. Is there even a, it's, it's minuscule. We're, we're keeping a running, ta running tally. So we have 400 members and, and we have started, like we said, what's the list? So we, you know, we're going through it. And, and we, we have to say black, indigenous, people of color, because that's, when you, that's where you start to get to numbers like out of 400, you get to 10, right? So this is a, it is a very, very small, small percentage of the larger group. I don't think it's a truth for the number of programs that are actually in fact uh, operating. I think what we what we know um, from the alliance in particular is that that these that they've been doing their work. They've been doing extraordinarily great work on their own and have really said, you know, we do not need to be part of a system in order to thrive and survive and to do our best work. And um, also the attitude of, of we always don't want to have to be the one to seek out the resources like we're doing our great work maybe you can turn your lens over here and come to us instead of focusing on this story program that has a certain reputation or prestige because of how long it's been in operation so we've had to change our posture of how we engage because it's no longer about saying well we know these folks have have reached out to us but now we're doing the deeper work of going to say who else is out there? Who, who's not miss, who's missing? Really examining that gap and saying, what can we do to bridge and uh, create relationship? But, but the numbers are small. And, and Yinka, you know this, the numbers are also small, even once we uncover that, is the amount of investment in terms of philanthropic dollars that go to any program that is, is, is built around Black and, and people of color it is very, very low compared to where the money goes uh, to the rest of the world. I mean, we're talking about less than 10% in terms of philanthropic dollars. And that's a huge issue. Uh, it, it's a major issue. No, I mean, no, absolutely. And, you know, and I want to bring us on here to economic impact. Yes. Of residences. Okay, so if you take um, something like the Studio Museum in Harlem, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, the two, you know, Thelma Golden's uh, uh, residency at the Studio Museum in Harlem. Now, that's a Black-run residency. Yes. The, the economic impact of that residency is phenomenal because a number of those artists have actually gone on to do amazing things. Now, they, right. they've been given a platform to actually develop their work you know, experiment their work. Now that on each one of those artists, it's created an incredible economic impact on the, on the opportunities and then the professionalism. And that economic impact has then directly impacted the community that those artists actually came from. So if you, um, and I, I kind of see residences as a kind of, you know, you're a scientist, you know this, as a sort of R&D, sort of, you know, research right. and development. <laughs> yes. You know, it's, like a, it's, a, it's a research and development platform. And so if artists are not getting that access to that research and development, then that then further impacts 
their economic chances along the line, not to mention the actual cultural impact of their production. Because we all know that an art education is not just purely for, for economic gain, it's also about cultural impact. And yeah. so being uh, deprived of those opportunities does have a far reaching impact down the line. Yeah. And, and I, I think the common answer, I think we see it um, time and time again repeated is that, well, we don't, we don't know anyone or we don't know how to engage or maybe this environment or place is hostile and, and, and not totally conducive for the way that that artist practice or um, that art doesn't fit within the context of the art that we actually support. You know, it's not excellent, right? So I, I think it's also um, the call to action for the field is to rethink what, what that checklist, that criteria for participation actually is, because it is probably the, the single most selection process that is one of the greatest barriers to entry, because there's a judgment based on someone else's assumptions, experiences, and, and, and biases that have really precluded these artists from participating. And, and, and we have to call that out. We, we have to say that and say that clearly. Um, and you and I, I think we're of the same school of thought, but you know, it's going to happen, right? Like we are going to build this world that we envision and it is gonna be with or without the current makeup. You know, you, I, I say this all the time to my membership. I talk to a lot of funders about this, um, any leaders that will listen. Um, but the opportunity is to get on board or get left behind. And you can keep doing things the way you want to do. That's everyone else's choice. But we are thinking about these world building activities that, that really create the world that, that we envision and that we all say we aspire to. Yeah, no, look, the thing is, I'm an artist, right? So my job is to kind of always think outside the box, mm -hmm. right? I'm, I'm not going to like fit, I'm not going to fit into the box, right? So, so I'm going to, I'm going to do things my own way. And I'm going to do it, you know, uh, when I did my residency in London, you know, the artist actually chose the next set of artists who are going to do the residency. Mm. You know, so, you know, so, and I, I'm not, you know, playing out of anybody else's rule book. You know, I, I choose my own because as an artist, I'm at liberty to do that. I don't have to follow any rules. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and we can create different models, you know, um, and I think that's, um, you know, that, that's what's, you know, that's what's important that we create the opportunities in the way that we see fit, right. you know, I mean, we, and then we also, and the other aspect of this, of course, as creatives, is that we do have to be business-minded. You know, residences cost money. Yes. And, and that's something that we need to be frank about. You know, we need to, you know, have created business models, you know, mm -hmm. to try and, uh, because business is power. And through business, through enterprise, you can actually empower people. And so, you know, there's a, an old fashioned way of thinking about artists and the, you know, the art world that um, I'm just sort of romantic and I don't think pragmatically. And no, I mean, you're, we're in business. We're in business. Yes. And, you know, you cannot empower yourself. If you if you shy away from enterprise, right? You know you, you have to be you know, and I think I think as black people we need to know that we need right. to understand that power lies in the dollars you have in your pocket. Yes, yeah. and you need you need you need to create um, those kind of business platforms that will then enable you to you know to empower yourself. And what I, I think the, what that brings to mind for me is also ensuring that it's not at the expense of the artists or the communities that are hosting you, right? Like there's oh, work. No. I mean, you have to, oh that, no, you have to do that with respect. 
with you respect. Know, yeah. Yes, and you must, you must, the community must own what you're doing. It, mm -hmm. it, must, it must be theirs. And yeah. they have to be able to see how they're going to benefit from what you're doing there. That reciprocity and that reciprocity yeah. is really clear. It's really evident. And, and as the operator and as the person who's leading the enterprise, you see your role as an intermediary in that work. But so many times we say, well, if the artist just pays this fee, or if we could just get them to donate half of their work that they created while they were here, we could keep our doors open to welcome one more black artist, right? Like it's that, it, it, th that's not your business model. No. That's not the enterprise model. No. That's, no. No. yeah, no, that's, <laughs> right. No, I mean, you're creating kind of par parallel enterprises. Right. That exactly. will actually benefit the people directly. You know, so they can see that they're employed. I mean, your presence here is actually giving me a job. Yes. And, and you know, and you're being fair in that process. So, yeah. no, I mean, this is, this is not about sort of, you know, robbing people and stealing their, you know, um, you know, go, the, this is not trying to repeat some kind of historical, um, you know, situation in which communities literally just get robbed. Yeah. You know, um, and, and, you know, and it's important for me that we, we put dollars back into those communities, you know, you know, and I have to say, it's not easy because, you know, you, you start with uh, capital spend and there's no, there's no immediate return for a while. And that return, and I don't necessarily mean, you know, uh, cash return. I mean, you have to build things and it takes a while. So you need patience to do that. And then, and then of course, you know, it's capital intensive and you have to, you know, you just have to see it as, um, you know, it, it is, it's not just um, philanthropy, it's also encouraging training and enterprise because right. we're training people as we're right. going along. So you're also leaving people the legacy of training. You know, they're not just walking away or just getting a, a menial job. You know, I mean, in the village, we, we trained people on how to, you know, how to manage greenhouses. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not something they ever, it's not something they ever, um, you know, came across. And we got uh, an, an agronomist to actually work with the people. So that's the level of commitment I'm talking about. Right, right, right. Um, Dita and Yinka, I have a question for you both. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, what, according to you, which, which tips would you be able to give to the arts and cultural managers that are watching this webinar to, to make a change, to make a positive change, to make sure that Black art and artists are more are represented uh, and, 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 and a representative of, of the sector? Which are, which are your top tips? Well, you know, in your question, you've kind of already answered the question because this is not rocket science, you know. Um, you don't have representation in your organization, address it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it, it's, um, I, you know, uh, people, you know, the, 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 the interesting thing is people come up to you and say, Yinka, so what do you think we can do? What do you think we should do? And I'm thinking, why are you asking me that? I mean, you can, you know, you, why are you asking me? You know, you've got the power to actually right. change things within your organization. You don't actually need black people to tell you that. You know, yeah. because black people historically always have to carry the responsibility for everything. You know, so why are people approaching black people and asking black people what to do? when they when they have the power and the resources to do things you know i don't have the you know i don't have the power and the resources i mean i have my own uh power and resources but there are people who are in much you know higher positions of power and they have easy access to resources and yet uh they don't address the problem you know? Yeah, I, have, I second that. I mean, it, I, I could have said it better. It, it's, 
once you acknowledge that the issue is there, it is yours to act upon. Um, there's not going to be some magic formula. If you see that change needs to happen and you feel like you cannot affect that change, um, your first thought, it seems like it's always to go outside of you. Let, let's ask Yinka, let's ask Lisa, let's ask the Black artists we know. Instead of holding up the mirror to yourself and saying, ask yourself, what is really holding me back? I need to get in touch with my own individual personal fear and biases and the, pro and, and, and the reasons why I feel like I am um, just, just, just held in this particular moment. And, and I think that, you know, not recognizing that the force of fear, right, and, the, and what kind of fragility and, and, and how that uh, really impacts your decision making and, and for you to hold space and not being able to let go, it, it's powerful. But the answer doesn't lie within us, you know, the, the answer lies within oneself. And if you don't, if you can't hold that space to hit the pause button and to really deeply interrogate what you're doing, how you're doing it, and why you're doing it, and get at that purpose and say, I need to develop an action plan to address that, then, then we'll keep asking this question. I've been asked this question for, I've been in the nonprofit world 20 plus years. I've been, answer, I've been asking, <laughs> I've been answering it. This, it's the same way, but I, I don't hold that power to, to change you, Luigi, or any other operator or the arts and cultural sector, but the, the power lies within oneself. And, and because of the privilege and the resources that are at your fingertips and, and what people will do based on the trust that's immediately bestowed upon you, just from being in the space with you, you have to leverage that. You, you have to do something different with that. And, and if you don't know how to do it, ask yourself why. Um, yes, and so also, you know, there's, a, there's, there's impact. There's, there's actually social impact by not being inclusive. It creates, it creates a horrible social impact because the social impact, it leads to economic deprivation. Mm -hmm. which will which disproportionately then will impact the people and the death of george floyd is a is an illustration of yeah. that level of impact so what might seem like an innocent uh decision not to uh, include people could have a horrible impact down the line and and so that's sort of you know that's how important this is you know, people don't realize that, you know, you and I may be talking about residencies, but actually, in effect, we're actually talking about social justice. Yes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And actually, uh, something that you both said before, uh, if, organ if certain organizations don't, will not change or don't want to change, let, let's be an alternative system. Because I, I, I don't see just inertia, I see resistance. Uh, it's not just about inertia to change. There is an active resistance to, to change, in, in, as far as I've seen in my, in my experience. And, and, and certain organizations won't be able to change because they, they were built on the wrong foundations. Uh, and, and there is a need for an alternative system. And, and I, think, uh, I think it's a matter of discourse. I think it's a matter of making sure that an alternative discourse is, is, is is built with a sound structure, uh, becomes visible, uh, uh, and, and becomes in a way self-sufficient. Some, some people don't, don't need to go anymore and ask the big organization for some visibility, for, for being recognized as an artist, for being given an approval label, as you were saying before, Lisa. Uh, I, I think that's, that's probably what we need to do. And, and it's not just on this issue. I think it's on many issues across society. It is a, there's a structural failing of, of institutions, but also of, of generally of, 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 of human beings. And, and, and I think it's, mm -hmm. I, I really second your, your call to action. Yeah, yeah. I hear this, this about the resistance and I see this question in the, tra in, in, in the chat about um, organizations being resistant, you know, individuals power organizations, we know this, but you know, as a black woman, you know, I, I always have to, always have to take an inventory of when I come into an organization, a job, a space, what can I do? Um, what do I want to do? What I want to commit to? And if at some point that it is, it is that I'm receiving this love work as being beaten down, 
I have to make the choice to leave that work. But as a black woman, I always have to create a new system. I have to create new pathways. I have to walk away. I have to turn down the job. I have to turn down the speaking engagement. I have to do extra work in other areas of my life. And so when I see this question about like resistance, you know, I do go back. It, it comes back to holding up the mirror to yourself and saying, you know, what is, where can I do my best work? Where can I live my life's purpose? Where can I contribute to the world that I want to live in? And if that means walking away, maybe that's the greatest act of love. Maybe that's the, where the work begins because then staying, right? And protecting, protecting individual interests, we thereby, we also become somewhat complicit. Because, yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah. No, and I think the important part as well is not to you know, to, to actually understand the power you have as an individual and to understand fully well that right. you have the power to, to, to change your own destiny and you can control, you know, you can control that. You, have, you know, you, you must start thinking of yourself as being empowered. Yes. You know, you don't need to wait for anybody else. You know, you need to be, you need to be creative. You know, I don't want to wait for anybody else. You know, I'm not waiting or begging you to give me an opportunity. You know, that's just not, you know, you can create your own. So, you know, so you've got two things going on. You know, we have to persuade the mainstream to have a, a more collaborative approach. But at the same time, we must also in ourselves negate the kind of, you know, historical, um, historical things that may want to keep us down or keep us less empowered. We have to move past that. So we too have a responsibility, you know, because uh, there is no, um, and, and we get that we do that by creating mutually supportive communities. Yeah. amongst ourselves so that if you look at the way the system is operated historically the system is actually operated through networks and we need to also create our own networks and that's how you know you create a, 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 a situation of mutual respect yeah. you know there's no point waiting for another network to help you I mean, of course, we welcome those who are willing to help and That's support. Right. We welcome that. But alongside that, we also have to create our own strengths and yeah. build, you know, that, that kind of structure. You know, we need our own strong structures. And then we can meet other people halfway. Right. Well, you know. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to... To both for the for the contribution we we exceeded our allocated time but i think it was well worth it um i, I think that the main three takeaways of today is that we, we need ambition uh, when you said before Yinka, that you we can change the world uh, I, I think it's really something that that, that, that that is really essential particularly for those who work in, in culture and the arts the, the idea that we all have power to change the world uh, uh, so the idea of having up an ambition and also the impact on practice that is really essential, how we make uh, organizations and systems work differently. And, and also it's about collaborating, it's about joining forces from various parts of society uh, and, and building an alliance uh, across uh, regions, uh, across races. Uh, across sectors, um, and 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 there is, I think there is the opportunity. And, and and again, when when someone is talking about going back to normal, uh, mm -hmm. I, I well let, let let's say no, no please, the normal <laughs> is is no, I don't I don't want to go back to normal. It might sound reassuring, but but it's scary. Yes, I second that. Yeah, I think I I agree. Yeah. Well, I th thanks a lot, and thanks to all the attendees who stayed until the, the very end. Uh, much, much appreciated. Uh, our next webinar 
uh, is going to be with uh, Lucy Osta and Marco Maria Zanin, and we are going to discuss about the environmental dilemma of artist residencies and traveling. Is it worth it? Should, should we keep on doing it? Which is another another key key question that I think we need to address in our in our practice. And thanks a lot again to Lisa and Ninka for for your time. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Lisa. Great talking to you, and Luigi. Thank you.